Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. I'm Chris Barrett, Executive Director of the Biocomplexity Institute at UVA, and I'm also a professor in the Computer Science Department. Um, I'm really a, it's a great privilege and a mm -hmm. pleasure to um, nice. uh, introduce and to welcome um, two of our distinguished institute professors, uh, Dan Rosenkranz and Dick Stearns, this week. And yesterday we heard from Dan, and, and uh, today we'll hear <clears throat> and, and interrogate uh, 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 Richard Stearns. Um, he'll be introduced later. I won't. I won't do that now. But the Exploring Biocomplexity series will feature more of our institute's distinguished scholars and and other renowned collaborators and luminaries in our virtual visits going forward. And we think this is just a, just a fantastic way to start. These are um, our friends for, for many, many years, decades, and, um, and, and, and real world changers. So we, we hope you all um, uh, enjoyed yesterday, and, and, and I'm sure that you'll also um, enjoy today. I think there's a couple of potential surprises uh, uh, today. Mata will probably tell you about that. So. With that, I'll, I'll hand it off uh, to Mara, I guess. Is it Mara I hand it off to? So whoever yes. it is I hand it off to. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, people are still uh, joining, uh, but uh, let me start in the interest of time. Uh, first of all, before we go through the events and I introduce Dick, I want to say a you know, how grateful we are to Grace, Paul, and Jill, and others for helping us organize this meeting. So thank you very, very much. We really appreciate all the efforts you've put in. The meeting went off very, very well yesterday, and I'm sure it will go well today and tomorrow as well. Um, so with that, uh, let me start. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Richard Stearns as, a, as part two of this virtual visit by Dan Rosencrantz and Dick Stearns to our institute here. I'll be, I'll take a moment and introduce Dick. Um, of course, he doesn't need much of an introduction, but I will still do that. And then uh, before I start, uh, I will, I would like to say a few uh, personal remarks and then we can officially start the meeting. So um, Professor Richard Stearns is a distinguished institute professor here at the Biocomplexity Institute and is also an affiliate faculty member in the computer science department at UVA. He has made a number of pioneering contributions <clears throat> to computer science and we'll hear a lot about it today. Uh, and probably the best way to summarize it is uh, Dick, along with Juris Manis in 1993, uh, received the ACM Allen M. Turing Award in recognition of their groundbreaking work in complexity theory. Uh, Dick, uh, spent a long and distinguished career at GRD Center, followed by his time at SUNY Albany. And then uh, after he retired, uh, he has been working with the biocomplexity group uh, for a long time. Uh, let me just summarize Dick's contribution by uh, talking about some of the work he has done. And I'm sure the sessions will of course uh, discuss this in great detail. But for those of you who do not know about this area, the term computational complexity was coined by Hartmanis and Stearns in their seminal paper back in about 1965. This work in conjunction with other work by professors Michael Rabin, Stephen Cook, Richard Karp, Manuel Blum provided the foundations of computational complexity as it is studied today. This work led to the Turing Award for Dick and Juris. And probably the best way to describe the impact and influence of the work that Atmanis and Stearns did is to simply quote uh, three very, very well-known computer scientists. And that's how I'm gonna do it. So let me begin by a quote uh, from Stephen Cook, who is the winner of the 1982 ACM Turing Award. And in his lecture, uh, he said thus, a second, early influential paper on computational complexity of algorithms by Hartmanis and Stearns was widely read and gave the field its title. The important notion of complexity measure defined by the computation time on multi-tape Turing machine was introduced and theorems were proven. The second quote is by Professor Richard Karp, 
who is the winner of 1985 ACM Turing Award, and also the winner of the Kyoto Prize and many, many other accolades. Uh, he goes on to say, but it is the 1965 paper by Hartmanis and Stearns that marks the beginning of the modern era of complexity theory. Using Turing machines as their model of abstract computers, Hartmanis and Stearns provided a precise definition of complexity classes, consisting of all problems solvable in a number of steps bounded by some function of n. All of us who read their paper could not fail to recognize and realize that we now had a satisfactory formal framework for pursuing the questions that Edmonds had raised earlier in an intuitive fashion. Questions about, for instance, whether the traveling salesperson problem is solvable in polynomial time. The last quote is by Professor John Hopcroft, who is also the winner of 1986 ACM Turing Award, uh, and also the winner of IEEE John von Neumann Medal. And he says, Turing's work might have remained in the realm of mathematics and logic, were it not for a seminal paper on the complexity of algorithms by mathematicians Hartmanis and Stearns. They measured the complexity of an algorithm by the number of steps needed for its execution used and used this method to develop a theory of complexity classes. The paper sparked the imagination of many computer scientists and led to the establishment of complexity theory as an integral discipline. Certain papers are important not only for their technical contributions, but more importantly, because they provide a conceptual view or establish a paradigm for research. The work of Hartmanis and Stearns attracted researchers and focused attention on this topic. Among the more significant advances that results resulted from this work were the classification of complexity of most major mathematical theories, the reducibility among combinatorial problems, the concept of NP completeness and a deeper understanding of concepts such as randomness. I point out that uh, along with his seminal work in computational complexity, Dick has done some amazing and influential work in game theory as well. Um, and I would like to read out a small paragraph from uh, the lecture, uh, the, the uh, document put out by the Nobel Prize Committee when Professor Robert Allman was awarded the Nobel Prize. Uh, and I'll, I'll just quote it. It says, during the Cold War between 1965 and 1968, Robert Allman, Michael Maschler, and Richard Stearns collaborated on research on the dynamics of arms control and negotiations. Their work became the foundations of the theory of repeated games with incomplete information. That is, repeated games in which all or some of the players do not know which stage the game is being played. They go on to say that the, the work introduces a number of interesting extensions uh, to this. Incentives to conceal or reveal private information to other players. For instance, how might a person, player, or firm, or a country who has extra information utilize it to their advantage? How might an ignorant player infer information known to other, another player by observing that player's past actions. Should an informed player take advantage of the information for short run games, thereby risking to reveal his information to other players? Or should he conceal the information in order to gain more in the future? Building on the work of John Hersanyi, Oman, Master and Stearns brought game theory to bear on these subtle strategic issues. It's an amazing amount of work that Dick has done. And to think that all of this was done by Dick in, in really the very early part of his research career is just mind boggling to me. So let me just uh, you know, have a short personal note and then we'll begin. Let me begin by, uh, like yesterday I said, uh, express my deepest gratitude to Dick for his mentorship, support and guidance over these 31 years. I began working with Dick as soon as I arrived in Albany, along with Harry Hunt. Dick Stern served as my PhD advisor. And honestly speaking, I did not have any clue of the work that Harry and Dick did when I first arrived from India to Albany. Uh, this was just, just a, a game changer for me personally. We have continued to work together for all these years. And it's been an actual absolute pleasure to interact with you, Dick. It is hard to describe in words the influence you have had on our pro professional lives 
We heard this from Dan and Ravi as well yesterday, and I'm sure they'll have more to say today. Your work, but along with it, your simplicity and humility are inspiring. And I hope we can all continue to work together many more years. With deepest gratitude and sincere thanks for all that you have done for me, Dick. So with that, um, let me start. Um, we have about 58 folks who have joined us. And I want to just take 30 seconds to see if Professor Alman has uh, joined. If he has, then I would like to give him a chance. Uh, Ravi, can you see him? Yes. Professor Auman, can you hear us? Yes, yes. Hi, hi. hi. I'm glad to be here. Yes, yes. yes. Professor and, Auman, uh, it's such a pleasure to have I you. Haven't, uh, I haven't uh, uh, communicated with uh, Dick for uh, many years, and I'm glad to see him here, and I'm uh, delighted to be here and listen to Dick. Professor Auman, I'm so happy that you can join us. Would you like to say a few words? I mean, this is such a pleasure to have you online today. Well, sure. I'm, I'm, uh, I've always uh, admired Dick, and, and I got to know him uh, just about 60 years ago uh, when uh, the uh, people who were reviewing his uh, uh, doctoral thesis at uh, Princeton uh, um, asked uh, me to look it over, and uh, and I saw that it was really a brilliant piece of work. And uh, for many years after that, we were in close contact uh, uh, with uh, Mike Mashler really taking the uh, spearheading the effort to stay in contact with with him. And I think uh, with Mike, you had a lot of. Uh, um, uh, personally, I think he visited you, or you visited him. Is isn't that correct, my? That's uh, correct. Yeah, uh, that's correct. And, and uh, we wrote a a a, a book. Uh, Mike, Mike, and Dick and I, and uh, Dick had some really good ideas uh, with this uh, arms control and disarmament agency uh, project. Uh, and I, I really hope, uh, uh, I really hope we help prevent the uh, third world <laughs> war. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I'm, I'm, I was very glad to hear and get the invitation a couple of days ago to come to this seminar. And so uh, I congratulate you. And I'm, I'm very interested to hear about biocomplexity. So. Uh, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, yeah. Professor Alman. That's so nice of you to give us a uh, speak of uh, a few words. Uh, uh, Mike Fisher is also online, and I wanted to see whether Mike, you have a few words you would like to say before we start. Uh, Mike, might not be, might be muted. Um, we'll come back to him. Ah. No, no, no I, mean, I, I don't have anything prepared right now, but except except to say that 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 that, that I was in in, uh, in graduate school when 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 the Hart Madison Stern's paper came out, and and I was I was very much influenced um, by that work, particularly in my first 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 job after uh, uh, getting my PhD, which which was in a, a slightly well, it wasn't that different an area. It was in formal language theory. So. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Fisher. So let me start, Dick, if you're ready. I'm uh, ready. Okay. So our first question, um, and we'll do the same way we did it last time. I'll do part one. Part two is done by Ravi. Oh, part two is done by Mary Lou. And then uh, we'll proceed further. So you did a math major, Dick, at Carlton College in Minnesota. Can you describe your experience at, uh, at Carlton College? And were you influenced to study math by your family or your high school teachers? Your first publication also resulted from your undergraduate thesis, as we understand. Can you talk briefly about that work as well? All right. Um, yes, my Carlton experience was uh, really great. The, the the emphasis on undergraduates and uh, getting to know the math professors well. Um, mathematics was, you know, always my favorite. 
Uh, I was a little bit, a little bit worried whether somebody could make a living as a mathematician. So when it came to uh, announcing a major, I really only had two options at that point. One was uh, chemistry and the other was mathematics. So I went to see the head of the math department and told him of my concern about making a living. And he assured me that, yeah, I certainly couldn't make a living as a mathematician. He knew one of his students was doing very well as a mathematician. And uh, so I picked mathematics as my, uh, as my uh, major. Um, let's say you have a multiple parts question. Yes, I was just asking about the paper you wrote as well. And uh, oh, the paper I wrote as an undergraduate thesis, as we understand. But we okay, yes, to uh, there were there were uh, two options. One uh, to be graduated with distinction, which meant you did well in your exams and things. And the other with honors, which uh, means you write down, uh, you know, do some kind of a, a paper. So I, I did something on uh, was graph theoretic uh, and nature. Um, and um, their results uh, about uh, voting and how you, how maybe the preferences of the various voters was indistinguishable. Well, it was not even, was an inconsistent. So uh, anyway, I did some computations for the three person case and came up with the probability that things would be inconsistent. And the advisors uh, advised me to uh, submit that to the Mathematical Monthly, uh, you know, which I did and which had got, got accepted now. You, you call that my first paper. Um, it's the first paper in my resume. Okay. But if you, uh, well, it's a little exercise, if you uh, Google Kuglin and Stearns, K-U-G-L-I-N, uh, might cast some doubt as to whether that was my first publication. Oh, okay. Thanks. That's great, Dick. Uh, my second question is really a, a follow on to this. You know, you went to Princeton. Can you tell us how you decide to go there and what your experience was? and uh, your work with uh, Professor Kuhn and of course, Professor Aumann. I mean, you know, you uh, started working with uh, Professor Aumann and Professor Master, I think towards the end of the thesis. So maybe you can just describe your experience uh, during your thesis and uh, th that time. Okay, well, the, uh, the chairman of the math department was friends with John Kemeny, uh, who set Dartmouth and uh, started the time sharing system and wrote some books. And uh, we were encouraged to meet with Dr. Kemeny. Uh, and he described the math program at 
at Princeton in such glowing terms that I decided that's where I wanted to go. So uh, that's what I did. Now, when I got to uh, Princeton, that was the source of game, uh, a lot of game activity, although it had kind of died down but by the time I uh, got there. And uh, that's, I had, as an undergraduate, I had, for some reason, I had picked a Norman Morgenstern's book. And uh, they developed game theory from scratch, thinking these are the, uh, these are the properties I want game theory to, uh, game should have and, and developed a model that uh, fit that. So when I was uh, very impressed, uh, I thought, well, that's the way mathematics should be done. Um, to be, get <laughs> connections to, to the real world by trying to model things carefully. So uh, you know, when I got to Princeton, there were a lot of a lot of uh, books in the bookstore that uh, had the uh, original game theory papers in them. The uh, the Orange Theory, which everybody calls the books, the Orange Books was a Princeton uh, University Press uh, contributions to game theory, one, two, three, and four. So uh, with that, I, I got quickly up to speed. And uh, so I asked, uh, Harold Kuhn, if he would be my thesis advisor. And uh, he said yes. And uh, well, he did look out for my interest and read uh, some of the manuscript. He, um, he didn't really have a problem for me, but he did uh, introduce me to uh, some game theorists as I came through. I remember he introduced me to uh, Shapley and, uh, and to Bob Bauman. And just by chance, Bob was at a job. Uh, well, not, he, he was located in a, in town in an office provided by the uh, Mathematica, which was a local concerted consulting for, for, uh, firm, but he had uh, he was working in connection with a, with a, some money provided by um, Morgan Cern. So he said he had some problems. So. I went to his office and he provided three problems. Uh, gave me a little bit of reading. And the one that interested me the most was uh, solutions to non-cooperative uh, three-person games. So uh, I came back to him and said, uh, that's what I wanted to do. And, uh, and making sure that I understood the proof of this paper, 
uh, you gave him a different proof, which was shorter. And uh, that seemed to close the closed the deal and I went off and worked on the problem. And finally I said, yes, uh, came back to him and said, yeah, I've worked out the solutions. And uh, he said, well, sh 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 <laughs> show me. So I had these ideas written down and just a few pages of notes. But as I started to elaborate on them, uh, an hour expired and it was still only part way done. So uh, we did uh, arrange another meeting. I continued and uh, at the end of that, I had uh, discovered a case that I hadn't, uh, I feel it wasn't covered. So when the third came along, I fixed that case and went on to the uh, conclusion. And uh, it turned out that that was Hello? Turned out that was basically my my thesis defense in that uh, several uh, year, year, several years later when I was looking at my manuscript I noticed that uh, there was one page where all the subscripts and superscripts uh, were omitted. Now, now in those days, uh, you know, you, you you did things on the on the typewriter, and the easiest thing was to go through and put the superscripts and subscripts in after the document had the page had been completed. So I knew that nobody had looked at that page very carefully. So uh, Bob must have made a good recommendation because uh, I went through with a, got my degree. <clears throat> that's that's great, Dick. I think uh, if I remember, you finished it in a record time of two years uh, after going to to Princeton. It's just quite uh, amazing to think that one could finish a degree at that time. Um, of course, we'll have another session, uh, third part, I think. So, when you know, we'll have more discussion about your work with Bob Oman. So, in the interest of time, I'll I'll pass the baton to uh, Mary Lou right now, Dick, if it's okay. okay. And, uh, uh, we can continue. Well, this may be, must have made one correction. Please, please do. I didn't. I didn't go. For, I didn't get my degree in two years. Okay. I got it in uh, three and a half years. Okay. And uh, three years was quite normal. With Princeton, you to work to to uh, two two years learning stuff. Uh, they had a comprehensive exam on certain topics. And you pass that, you went on to your, allowed to go on to your thesis. So there's nothing record setting. Okay. okay. In today's time, it's certainly, that's still a very fast time, Dick. I think it takes because the area has matured, of course. That's great. So May Lou, do you want to take over? I'll pass the baton to you. Um, we'll come back to the game theory work very soon. Okay. Hi, Dick. It's been a long time since we've talked. It um, has, yes. Let me introduce myself first. I'm Mary Lou Sofa. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Virginia. 
Before that, I was a professor at the University of Pittsburgh where Ravi was a graduate student and took my compiler course. And his advisor, Errol Loy, who I think is on the Zoom, uh, was my very dear friend and colleague. And I begged him when I went on sabbatical to teach my compiler course, although he was a theorist. He did, but he said he would not teach it again. Um, so before then, way before then, um, when I graduated with a bachelor's degree in mathematics, my first job that I took was a general electric research lab. And if you can believe it, in my group, there was Dick, uh, Phil Lewis, Joris Harmantis, uh, Don Rosencrantz, and Jerry White. And it was a fabulous, fabulous group of, uh, of men that I worked with. Um, it was an amazing environment because there were always ideas and talks going on in the hall and at lunch and at break. And it was like in the air. And I have to say, I didn't understand everything that was going on, but I sure as heck learned enjoying it. Um, I also want to say that these young men, even though I did not have their status or stature, these young men were so kind to me and so inclusive um, that they encouraged me to do whatever I wanted to do, as well as treated me very fairly. And I'm pleased to say that throughout the years, even though they have written in their statue, they still are wonderful human beings. And I know most of them are still, so I thank them for that. Um, so there's one story I want to tell about Dick. And so when we were together, we one time talked about playing bridge. And I had played bridge in college, but I wasn't a real good bridge player, but I was kind of proud of myself. Um, so Dick and I played one time and I beat him and I was very proud and then I played another time and I beat him again and I'm thinking, gee, I'm pretty good. And then the third time we played, he beat me in two minutes. And then the third, next time he beat me in one minute. And so I said, Dick, did you let me win those first two games? And he would not say yes or no, he just laughed. And I would not play him after that because I knew he was just uh, pulling me in so he could beat me soundly, which he did. Uh, so um, the environment there was so stimulating that I quit after a year, but I quit to go on to get a PhD in computer science. And these guys really uh, uh, were instrumental in me wanting to learn more about what was going on and, uh, and, and, and be able to understand what they were all talking about. So thank you, Dick, and thank, thank uh, Dan and Phil and yours. So let's ask, I'd like to ask some questions, Dick. And first of all- Okay, could I, could sure. I make a comment? Sure. Uh, when you uh, applied to uh, GE and came for a uh, came for a visit, I was I just started there permanently, and you were the first person I ever interviewed for a uh, a job. And now now it's come full circle in the uh, sixty years. Now you're interviewing me. <laughs> but not for a job. Not for a job. <laughs> Although there is one. I'm sure I could get you one if you want. Um, you know, the computer science department is always looking for good faculty, so you're welcome to apply. Um, so as a professor, um, when you finished your and I'm the professor, as you finished your degree, um, you didn't go into the university, but instead took a job at the research lab, GE research lab. Um, could you tell us a little bit, what, did, you just, did you think about going to the university and why did you choose 
GE Research Lab? Well, um, yes, the, um, the research lab at that time would uh, look for PhD students with uh, potential and invite them there for the summer and uh, see if they'd get be interested enough to uh, you know, to come back. Um, well, the I had never heard of GE Research Lab. But I had a friend from college, and uh, he interviewed uh, at Harvard for, with the GE recruiter. And uh, then he told them, oh, you should uh, consider Dick Stearns, too. So they invited me up for an interview, and I, I took the summer job there. So just this chance event um, led me to the research lab and um, so uh, when I got there, the uh, the work of the work you know, the staff would recommend, would have problems uh, recommend that you look at. And uh, Hart Manis was I just completed his work on, on partition pairs, sorry, and on partitions, partitions with the substitution property. And he showed me a more general concept of uh, uh, two partitions, one on the input and one on the, on the outputs. So on that uh, summer, I worked on that problem and got uh, added some terminology and uh, described the lattice more succinctly with called MM pairs. And uh, wrote a uh, paper, a follow-up paper on the, the state assignment one paper into the state assignment two. So uh, I was well equipped I was well equipped to uh, I was <laughs> learn learned how to you know what it was like with that GE with contacts and uh, then I got back to uh, Princeton uh, and that's when I was introduced to Bob Alman and then started my my thesis work and then uh, Dick Shuey was head of the lab. Oh, yeah. Of our group. Yeah, I forgot about him. <laughs> Could I just uh, break in for a moment and uh, say goodbye? And it was very nice uh, seeing uh, Dick and everybody else over here. Uh, and uh, so, and uh, one of the advantages of the uh, pandemic uh, that we're undergoing, all undergoing, is that uh, from Jerusalem, I can join you in Virginia, and it's no problem. I don't have to leave my house. <laughs> so uh, regards, uh, greetings from Jerusalem, and uh, good evening. Uh, for me, it's evening. Uh, good, good day for you. And uh, all, all of you and all of us should be uh, well. And thank you very much for the invitation. Thank so, you. Uh, uh, oh. good afternoon. Okay. Yes, thank you, Bob.
Yeah, thank you very much. We'll be in touch, Professor Raman. Thank you very, very much. It means a lot to us. Go ahead, Mayor Lusso. Go ahead, Dick. Oh, okay, so, uh, you know, yes, uh, Dick Chewy uh, called in uh, you know, January or something, asked I wanted to play a num num nut. Wanted to come back for another summer. And I said, well, I think I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> so uh, switched over to offering me a permanent, a permanent position. And uh, that was essentially the only, the only offer I had. <laughs> so naturally, uh, naturally I went on to, uh, to work there. And I, I didn't really feel I would be good at teaching at that point. So I was, was I was really interested in this other kind of work. Okay, okay. So in <clears throat> previously, you had talked about how you got your PhD topic by speaking with your advisor and he gave you a couple problems which you then worked on. Uh, but when you're in a research lab, there's not a student advisee advisor relationship. So how did you get started on your computational complexity work with yours? Did you go give him some problems and have him have him try to solve them, or did he do that to you? Or how did this start? Well, we continue working closely on the implications of partition pairs. But yours said there ought to be some way of capturing the, the, the notion of information. And then to explain uh, <laughs> to explain why some problems are hard, and um, so we set out to you know, to, <laughs> to see if we could work out what that might be. You now he was thinking in terms of how uh, you know, information was handled in, in information theory and that didn't uh, quite fit. So at some point we came up with uh, with, a, with a model of a set of all things that can be done with a certain time. And that was that was really the breakthrough idea because of all the things, the attempts that other people had been making. Um, there was people have been trying to prove the complexity of individual problems. And uh, some without much success. And uh, some like Manuel Blum, he proved, he proved there, were, there existed problems were very hard, but he couldn't show like that a particular problem was hard. In fact, I mean, that's something can't do to this day. So uh, once we came, uh, got this idea of a uh, complexity class, um, and we were inspired by this by uh, work on Yamada, who did, who talked about things in 
that were real time constructible. But the idea of real time had been had been around, and yet as also a complexity class. So there was, there was one example in existence. So once we had the idea of a complexity class, then uh, things went on, on long very quickly, but uh, particularly the, the hierarchy theorem. So Dick, I have a thought. Dick, can I interrupt you just for 30 seconds? I have a very pleasant surprise for you. Uh, okay. Timing, I wanted to choose the right time to do this, but Professor Hartman is, has just joined me on the phone. And uh, I thought uh, I would surprise you with Professor Hartman as being on the phone. You know, uh, Professor Hartman, is, can you hear us? Yes. Yes, uh, I thought you could say a few words uh, because Dick is just starting to describe the work with you. So I thought this is a perfect time to introduce you and, and let you speak uh, and say a few words. If it's okay, very low. Dick. Yeah, go ahead, Yurish. Wow. Uh, yeah. I'm very hard pressed. I don't really know uh, what is a theorem. Uh, the, the meeting. The, this meeting uh, is to just uh, discuss Dick's work, uh, Juris. So you can you can say hello to Dick and Mary Lou here uh, if you want to say, and um, just a few words would be good enough. Hi, hi, yours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he says hello to you, uh, yours. Yes. Uh, wow. Well, Dick, what new? Any, any chance? of them setting our book rolling. Right, Yuris, uh, uh, we can, I can certainly discuss that. It's certainly on our, on our uh, uh, you know, on a list of things to do. Uh, and I will certainly get back to you with more details on it. Uh, but I was thinking if you just have a message for Dick right now uh, about the work you and Dick did together. Sorry? It's uh, my message for Dick now. Yes, if you have any any message you want to give to the the audience here about the work you and and Dick have done in the past. Well, <laughs> uh, kind of strange. I. Keep thinking about much of it, and I am really impressed by the perception which we showed uh, working on it. Uh, you know. We started uh, with a pretty blank face and uh, wound up with, I think, a pretty good outline and igniting of lots of work in uh, computational complexity. That's, that's wonderful, Yuris, great. Uh, I let Dick continue, and uh, you can you can hear him uh, for a while, and then you let me know. And then uh, uh, you know I know you need to go as well, but um, let me uh, pass the token back to Dick. You can hear him describe the work you folks have done, which everybody so inspired and wants to hear about. Thank you very very much again. Uh, but I'll keep you on the phone, and you can continue to hear Dick. Yeah, Dick, go ahead. Please. Yeah, Dick, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, big go ahead. Thanks. Okay, so 
uh, we had finally uh, picked the model that uh, we uh, we used, and um, it. Um, And then we wanted to prove some theorems to go with it. Uh, the most famous one is the hierarchy theorem, which says that uh, von original form, which Henny and I later improved upon, was that if the one, if the ratio of the square of the one function was uh, divided by the second function. If that went to zero, then the uh, second function gave you more or more problems than the first. So, uh, so that was. Uh, That was certainly the the one one that drew uh, everybody's attention. We also had a speed up there, which said you could run a Turing machine twice as fast as redesigned the Turing machine, twice as fast to put out the same uh, outputs. And uh, for that reason, set of things that you could do in time t uh, was the same as the set of things you can do in order time t. Um, and then we 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 argue that there were other instead of being uh, Based on Turing machines, you might, you know, have variations like uh, Turing machine and square tapes. But we argued that those, we argued that it didn't make much difference which of those models you used, because uh, soon. Uh, those advantages were swamped by the larger problems. Did this include the multi-tape touring machine? Uh, yes. Oh, yes. We uh, it was all, all done with multi-tape touring machines because, um, well, we, we had to we had to keep track of the upper of the number of operations we had taken. And so you could devote, you give me many tapes, I can devote some of them just toward that calculation and use the remaining ones for the main computation. So, but the Uh, the, the odd thing about the the, here, the the theory is that our hierarchy theorem uh, did not necessarily apply that n cube is any harder than n squared because because you had to square the the f squared and uh, to prove uh, uh, <clears throat> to make them close enough. So that there would be jumps and uh, no, as you went up uh, I, and about powers of powers of n, there could be jumps because the 
complexity theorem was not fine enough to <laughs> to prevent that. So, uh, I mean, there's a, uh, I know there's some questions about Henny and Stearns. And maybe I shouldn't answer any more <laughs> So somebody ask it. Continuing on that line, how did you and yours uh, team up with Phil Lewis then? You and yours, yeah, team up with Phil Lewis to work on space complexity. So what, how did that happen? What drew that kind of work? Well, uh, I mean, Phil's office was uh, right next to yours. And uh, he said, well, we got to, we got to, uh, we got to work on space complexity. And at first that seemed kind of kind of trivial because the results all all went <laughs> followed the same plan as the as the other as the time complexity. So um, but then uh, we came up with improve the model. You know, it comes back to having the right model. And we had the idea that we would not count the input tape. So whereas before you're, you're, you had to uh, you couldn't do anything less, you know, in quicker time than linear time, because the linear and the <laughs> linear and the, the you had to read the input. Um, I mean, you know, the you need you need an end just to just to present the input to. The, to the machine. But once you say we're not going to count the those squares that you need to present the input, then uh, then a lot of interesting things uh, happened. And uh, you know, for example, you could talk about uh, log n time, sorry, log n space. So, uh, and, and uh, it was about that time that Eurus was leaving for Cornell. So, uh, new, uh, new relationship with uh, Phil was developing to fill in that need. Good. Maybe. So maybe I'll open the yeah, door up for questions. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Thank you. Can, yeah. So um, are there questions, especially since Dick said something about questions about Penny's work. So maybe somebody <laughs> will have a question well done. And if you have a question, just speak up. You have to unmute yourself and then speak up, folks. All right, so it seems that people don't know about the questions you want to avoid about Henny. So. We'll leave that for a while. And now I'll turn it over um, to, I think, Mav. Ravi, I think. So Ravi is going to take the next Ravi. one. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, hello, uh, my, my name is Ravi. Uh, 
I've been a colleague of uh, Dick since 1984. Uh, I, I even remember the day uh, that, I, that I met Dick. It was March 14th, 1984. That was the day I interviewed for a job at SUNY Albany. Uh, I, I met him for breakfast that day. Uh, I didn't think I would get an offer from them because they had started research in theory. But nevertheless, I think Dick decided to, Dick was a chair at that time. I think he decided to take a chance on me and hire me. Uh, so a few days before I joined SUNY Albany, uh, I met with uh, Dick and uh, he emphasized the need for uh, both teaching and research. My very first class was uh, a class, discrete math class with 250 students, undergraduate discrete math class with 250 students. And Dick took me to this large classroom which is known as LC7, Lecture Center 7 at, at SUNY Albany. And he showed me how to use all the audiovisual facilities and audio facilities. There were, there were no visual facilities at that time. Uh, so uh, he, he did that. Um, as a junior faculty, okay, whenever I needed some money to attend a conference or send a student to a conference, I would go to Dick and say, Dick, I need about $300 to attend this conference. And Dick, with a smile on his face, would say something like, yes, I do have some secret parts of money and I'll give it to you. <laughs> I still remember those conversations and I've had the pleasure of working with Dick. Uh, our first paper appeared in 1985 or so. We are still continuing to work. Um, among the research thing that he worked on, th th there are two things that stand out in my mind. Okay, one is uh, when we started okay, working on uh, discrete dynamical systems with uh, uh, Chris Barrett, uh, Mado, Dan Rosenkranz. Um, okay, Dick came up with a very beautiful uh, potential based, potential function based argument in order to show that a certain reachability problem was doable in polynomial time. Okay. The, the other thing is much more recent. Uh, there is, we were looking at, uh, this is again, Madhav, myself, Deanne, and Dick. Okay. We were looking at uh, the problem of uh, what's called sensitivity of a certain class of Boolean functions. Okay. There was a complicated proof that was known, okay. but Dick came up with an idea okay, using sets, uh, certain sets and relationship between those sets. Yeah, that provided an elementary proof of that result. Okay. Uh, you know, that, that proof not only gave the, the best bound, it also identified all the possible worst case things for that situation, but as a more complicated proof, identified just one. So these are things that uh, uh, I really remember, and uh, you know, these are a great pleasure to work with Dick. Uh, so, so Dick, I'll, I'll focus on uh, your, your uh, work at Albany. Uh, again, please, no, feel free to be brief. There, there's no need to elaborate on, 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 on these questions at all. Okay. The first question that I have for you is, uh, what influenced you to join SUNY Albany? Well, the uh, atmosphere at General Electric uh, was um, becoming more of what can you do for me now? Or can you get a grant to support this? Or who, uh, some part of the company, you know, that will support this. Although I was just somewhat exempt from this, I was feeling uh, Feeling the pressure. Uh -huh. So uh, the second uh, the second thing was that uh, what was this? Uh, well, the second the second thing was that I was no longer. Uh, scared of, of uh, the academic uh, life I felt that I had as, as opposed to when I was first starting out that I had things of my own that I could contribute to the to the educational um, to education uh, Thirdly, uh, uh, the university was offering me a uh, salary which was quite comparable 
to what the, the what the Sunni assembly was was my you know my thing. I think it was a thousand dollars less to stay at the stay at GE, but the, the raises for at GE were coming along, and I probably would have been making more money at GE after. So uh, I decided the difference was nothing to make a fuss about. Um, so it was kind of a midnight, mid, mid-life, you know, crisis. And uh, here I, I wouldn't have to get a new wife. Uh, I would just... Uh, all I had to do was change one thing, and that was where I worked. And my children could, uh, you know, continue with uh, their education in the town that uh, I lived in. So uh, it seemed uh, I could switch without without changing the other parameters of life. And so uh, all those considerations, uh, I decided to make the change. Great, great. I think my second question is- Wait, uh, let, me, let me interrupt a minute. On the chat, uh, Andy Deitch has said, what can you do for me now is still the attitude at GE Research. So okay. it's good that you know. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Andy Deitch was an undergrad. He also got his MBA from Sony Albany. So I know him pretty well. Uh, so th thank you, Andy. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Dick, again, you worked with many people, including me at, at uh, Sony Albany. Uh, what, what we would like to ask you about is your work with Harry Hunt. Uh, there are two, uh, you know, very special components in it uh, uh, for us. Okay, one is the work on um, uh, satisfiability hypothesis of power indices. Okay, that is, uh, you know, pretty close to what people call the satisfiability hypothesis or the exponential time hypothesis these days. And, and the second work that you did was on subproblem independence, which is again uh, a forerunner to the work on um, uh, tree width. Uh, 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 you know, tree with bounded, uh, doing things efficiently when graphs have bounded tree width. Um, maybe you can comment briefly about those, those pieces of work, Dick. All right. The, uh, the first piece of work on the on um, the power and power indices. I wouldn't. There's, I think there's considerable difference with that in the, uh, in the um, strong and the weak, uh, what are the columns? The strong exponential time hypothesis, Dick? Right. I mean, they, as I understand it, the uh, the hypothesis is that sat cannot be there. There is some constant such that sat can't be defined, can't be solved any quicker than um, two to that constant. Sorry, that constant. To to uh, no, the, the the they're addressing the instead of saying well it takes two to the end time, perhaps something could be done less say eight to the, eight, eight to the end. 
Right, right. Well, they express the thing a little differently. What they're really saying is that satisfiability can't be solved in less than a to the n for some a. Okay, right. And the strong hypothesis is that that is a is equal to two. That's right. That's right. So our our notion of the uh, power index um, says that set um, set can't be solved and two to the end of the one minus epsilon. Uh, two to the end uh, of the epsilon. That, that's why I remember that uh, for any epsilon greater than zero. Yes, the, the, the yes. The power or the power index focuses on the exponent the x the exponent of the exponent it says two to the two to the uh, two to the n one to the one power or or two to the uh, it can't be solved any faster than yes in other words, uh, you can solve it in two to the n to the x, but x has to be smaller than, yes, yeah, smaller than two. So it is, uh, it is a much, is a much more con uh, broader concept, and that there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of functions which would satisfy the satisfiability condition, but not the strongly uh, exponential <laughs> the exponential. Uh, Hypothesis. Uh, so, so I don't know if I've answered your question. Are you hoping I'd say something else? What was the other thing? Oh, yes. About that, that sub problem independence and lay, the tree width. I think the idea this is a forerunner to the idea of tree width. Yes. We, uh, we think that. Uh, We, we we think that the the uh, let me get a drink here. Please take your time. Please take your time. Uh, Ravi, no, other. We're just thinking maybe we can. Uh, it's two fifteen, so after this maybe we can speed up things a little bit. But that's right. In fact, I was going to pass the baton back to Mary Lou right after this. Right. All right. So you want me to answer this? Sure, sure, please. It's, quite, it's, it's the uh, it's the idea that the complexity of the, of these tree width problems are better understood in algebraically right, right. and that you really are computing a uh, sum of products right, right. or uh, and the more you can factor that down does instead of having some of all the variables have uh, the uh, some variables appearing only in the sub expressions. 
Right. So the more, more you get things down into subtractions, uh, the less you have to you have to apply to all cases. There's a nice thing about this deck. It could extend to the quantified SAT case also, remember. And you could make up these quantified, the quantifiers can be things like counting stuff and so on. And hierarchical stuff too, yeah. which Venkatesh thesis is based on and he's there. Exactly, right. right. It's amazing. Dick has brought time back into picture. In fact, it's during award lecture, it is time to reconsider time. And I think he has done it on both ends of the spectrum. <laughs> on the exponential end of the spectrum and then the polynomial time end of the spectrum. So it's, it's quite okay. nice to see that. Okay. So the day in terms of time, what I'll do, I'll, I'll pa pass a baton back to Merilu, uh, except I just want to uh, say a very short story about Merilu's kindness. Uh, as Merilu said, I, I was a graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh and I took a compiler, a very delightful compiler class. Um, I took a qualifying exam that, that had four parts in it one, one part was uh, programming languages. I apparently did well in the other three parts, uh, but I did not do well in the, the programming languages part, but Merilu was kind enough to pass me and then so that I could go get a job. Okay, otherwise I would probably still be doing my PhD at the University of Pittsburgh. <laughs> Thank you, Merilu. Yeah. Okay, let's see, I'm unmuted. Well, I hope you've learned more about programming language in the years between. I did teach compiler class, uh, Berlu. I did teach the undergraduate compiler class at uh, at uh, uh, SUNY Albany three or four times. So yes, I, I did. Uh, I I don't think I would have satisfied your uh, uh, criteria, <laughs> your standards. But <laughs> thank you. So, Dick, what has attracted you to the Biocomplexity Institute? Well, my uh, friends and students are uh, working there and have uh, sponsored, I guess, as uh, subcontractors, uh, Rosencrantz and uh, Ravi and myself and uh, Madhav. And so we've been working on uh, working problems together and spending a little bit of money my way, so. Okay. So, um, you said that you didn't take a university job initially because you were concerned you couldn't teach well, but then you did take a university job. So do you have any advice to junior graduate students? Um, was your path, do you think the right path for, I'm sure it was the right path for you. Do you think it's the right path in general? Well, the, I don't think my path is available now. The, 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 the research, facilities are, I mean, it's all over that they're asking, what can you do for me now? It's not a feature of GE, it's a feature of the, I know it's a feature of the times. What did you do, what did you enjoy about your academic position? Well, I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed the people I had to work with and I mean, research wise. Um, that was, uh, you know, and I enjoyed certainly uh, presenting my own theories to, uh, classes. Uh, I took a, no, as my contribution to the teaching load, I took on uh, 
the introduction to computer science for non-majors. It was basically teaching uh, basic and then that was uh, these were large classes. Pleasant, pleasant experience. That's right. These uh, were classes as well. I had to had to deal with cheating. <laughs> uh, you know, people submitting the same programs. Dental could say they would submit identical programs and I'd call them in and they'd say, oh, these programs are not the same. Uh, I don't even know this other person. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that part was kind of a chore. Yeah, they're not identical because the variable names have been changed. <laughs> That's what I use. <laughs> Instead of I, I, he used K. Um, so there, are, I can open it up for questions. But is before I do that, is there anything you want to say uh, to the young computer scientists that are coming out, or to the old folks like us? Well. Uh... I recommend retirement for the old folks. <laughs> for the old folks. <laughs> I have to talk to you about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you're, uh, even though we met in the 1960s, you're so much younger than me and certainly not thinking about retirement. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Lost my train of thought here as I. Uh, advice to the new new computer oh, scientists. Or advice to the new. Advice for the old folks retirement. Yes. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, main. Uh, the main advice is to to do what you do what you love, and. Uh, that should be, that should overwhelm your choice of where to go or what to work on. I know with the, oh, the uh, Heidelberg Laureate form, uh, meets every year and invites all past awardees, the Turing Award and a few other awards uh, to come. And they have a, on Wednesday, they always have a boat trip. So uh, one of these boat trips, uh, one of the young researchers came up to me and asked uh, for advice. And uh, I said, do what you love or something equivalent. And she said, that's what everybody's telling me. But is she accepting that advice? <laughs> OK, so let me see if there's anybody who has a question or a comment they'd like to make. I'll, uh, I'll ask a question. This is Andy Deitch. Hello, Andy. So, uh, first, first comment is, uh, Mary Lou, you'll be proud of Ravi because he was my professor to teach me uh, compilers and programming languages and all of that stuff. And he inspired me to go on. And I ended up uh, working at uh, GE Research where I worked with Jerry White very closely, actually. He ran the statistics program. Um, but my question for uh, Professor Stearns is, uh, what was the focus of your work at GE? Well, the, uh, 
Well, well starting uh, starting with finite state machines, uh, going on to uh, complexity theory, and then on to uh, questions of uh, context-free grammars and and uh, and, 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 and compiling. Thank you. So being somebody who spent some of her research time in compilation, do you think there's um, there's something that we can do in compilation today, or is the research pretty much done? And there are no real challenges. What do you think are the challenges in compilation today? Um, I guess it's a, a, compilate, comp, uh, compiling for. specific problems like uh, you know those are these no artificial intelligence ideas and mm -hmm. and deep learning and how to how to uh, uh, you know what what new concepts to Incorporate into the language in order to make it more useful. Okay. okay. Um, any questions? Any other questions? I've got a question. Sure. So I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to just introduce herself. Just. Uh, I'm Tom O'Connell. I was uh, a PhD student with Dick, uh, graduated in 2000. I did my thesis with Dick uh, just before he retired. And I, I'm, now a, I'm now a teacher up in, uh, at Skidmore College in, in New York. But uh, when I was, uh, I remember one time uh, during my research with Dick, I, uh, I was presenting a proof and, uh, and Dick said to me, I don't understand what story you're trying to tell. I was like, story. I'm trying to present a proof. What's that do with the story? And uh, but I thought of that day a lot since then. And, and really, um, that idea of telling a story is is kind of uh, something I use all the time. I'm constantly asking both faculty and students here, what is the story you're trying to tell? And I, every time I develop a class, I try to figure out what is the story that I'm trying to tell in this class. And, and even developing the whole entire curriculum here, that's, that's been my, you know, kind of my mantra through, throughout. So with that in mind, Dick, do you have, is there anything, um, you know, you've worked in a lot of different areas. Is there a storyline for all the work that you've done? Like, is there some kind of common theme that runs through all this work? I mean, you've done things from game theory to complexity theory. Is there, is there some common theme through all of this? Well, the uh, they're all they're all things I'm fairly good at. Uh, and there there is opportunism and you know I'm picking research uh, topics and. Um, So, yeah, doing what you, you know, doing what you love. Um, yeah, the, uh, the one thing you said earlier, it's always important to have the right models. It's something I think seems to always uh, be a focus for you. You always seem to be looking for that, uh, for that under yes. model. 
Tom, one of Dick's favorite expressions when, when we talked was garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> that was one of Dick's favorite expressions whenever we talked about models. I remember taking part in some of the initial discussions with you and Dick when you started your research. So, okay. uh, Ravi, a quick comment on that. I think the garbage in, garbage out for models is perfectly true for the field of machine learning. <laughs> Ganesh was also a PhD student at Albany. Um, I think he spoke yesterday also. Ven Ravi, uh, Venkatesh, uh, Melu and Ravi, it's okay. Venkatesh was another student of Dick and he's online. I thought if he wanted to say a few words. Uh, it would yeah. Be um, sure, uh, thanks Madhav. Um, so Madhav and I uh, were students of Harry Hunt and uh, uh, Dick Stearns. Um, so um, like, when um, Harry and I would um, uh, work on a problem and think that we had some good results and uh, like maybe Dick might have been in class or something. And then when he came back, we would say, okay, this is the result we got. And uh, uh, Dick would be able to um, extract the, the gist of it and uh, present it back to us in a way which would be much more presentable and uh, that was something that we really appreciated from him. Uh, the other thing that uh, I really enjoyed uh, doing with Dick was, uh, I was his uh, uh, TA for Automata Theory, uh, which is a pretty difficult class for uh, the, even grad students. So uh, it was a pleasure to be the, the TA because I got to learn um, Automata Theory in more detail. And then I would have, um, the discussion sections where I I had to represent whatever Dick presented um, once again, so that uh, people who did not have the background could actually uh, like fill in the holes that they were missing when uh, they could not understand uh, in the class itself. And uh, it was uh, like quite surprising when uh, students who uh, even the mediocre students were able to actually come up with uh, good solutions to a uh, fairly difficult uh, automata uh, theory uh, problems. So um, it, it was really great to be a, a TA for uh, Dick also. And um, again, uh, in every um, research paper that we did together, like one of the things that uh, Dick uh, and Harry had worked on was power indices, but um, out there in Europe, they had similar ideas, but they had different uh, phrasings for it, a different uh, terminology for it. So like some of the papers that Madhav and I worked on, like the tree weight and uh, various other, uh, like the dynamic problems, like, as as, like if we just took the ideas that Harry and Dick had and put it in a terminology, which was quote unquote fashionable, Suddenly, we saw a, a large. It became a paper generator. Generator. Uh, once we had, we took the basic ideas that Harry and Dick had been working on, and uh, converted it into uh, terminology which was more common. And uh, that was probably like one of the things that Madhav and I uh, initially saw, and then I think Madhav took it uh, to much greater extents over the years. Thank you. Thanks, so thanks uh, Professor uh, Stearns, for all your help and uh, guidance. No, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, if it's okay, Meilu and, and Ravi, given where we are, I thought we could give a chance to a few other folks to say, uh, you know, uh, give their remarks. Seth Chaikin, who is our professor at Albany, is kindly joined as well. Uh, Seth, I can see you online. If you want to say a few words, you had a long association with Dick as well, and um, good to see you, of course, after so many years. Yeah, uh, hello, everybody. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's see. I joined UAlbany in 1980, and uh, the uh, the the, the uh, I was I was very much attract. I was attracted to UAlbany, and uh, it was I guess it was you know, mutual that. Uh, I was contacted to be encouraged to apply there by Peter Bloniars. 
as well as I, you know, it's he, it, it was an appealing place to me because uh, my interests uh, were a combination of 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 uh, theory, mathematics, uh, with uh, so sort of a liking for uh, you know technology technology structure. Uh, so with the uh, the uh, the the slant and uh, uh, you know sympathy for uh, or appreciation of theoretical approaches to computer science. Uh, together with the uh, the the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the uh, the 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 drive to uh, build up st strength in applied areas of computer science, you know, led me to find U Albany was a very attractive place for me to join. Uh, so, including the uh, though the the uh, the well known theoretical computer scientists on the faculty at the time, including Dick were a great attraction to me to uh, to join the faculty and and uh, I was, uh, in retrospect I'm, I'm very much appreciative that uh, you know that they uh, supported my career there oh it was supposed to be a long career I'll uh, say about retirement uh, when I was thinking about retirement I I spoke with Dick I guess it was yeah after he retired and I was surprised uh, to hear, I, I felt the surprise that he had retired when he was so young, <laughs> which encouraged me to to uh, take a similar move. But again, uh, this I'll, I'll harp on to the very same advice everyone gives, uh, which is to which is to uh, do what you uh, what you love most. Uh, I don't know. Here's a crazy question. I might maybe Dick could could address. What would you say is is one of the the uh, what are some of the surprising developments that occurred in computer science over the span of your career? You know, this is something I think about for myself. But I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts about that are. Okay. Um, as I have a theory that the, um, the that the, that as the computer computing power becomes more and more, there are certain things that open up, mm. and uh, going back to you know when I started, uh, I finally got a terminal. Yeah, <laughs> now that, that I only had letters on it uh, but the or the change in operating system of windows in particular uh, that became possible only because the you know the technology was fast enough to do uh, graphics now right now uh, we're reaching a, a stage where uh, deep learning is uh, possible. That the, and the ideas, I, as I understand it, were always there. Suddenly, uh, suddenly you can. Uh, these things become within reach. Great, Dick. Thanks so much. Thanks, uh, Seth. You know, we are past time. Um, I will just say a few fine remarks, but I think it would, uh, we would not have finished this session well if we did not give Dan Rosencrantz a chance to say a few words, because I think among all of us, uh, Dan has had an amazing uh, relationship with Dick uh, that spans such a such a long time. So Dan, uh, let me give you the final word on this and then we'll conclude uh, very soon after that, but please go ahead. Well, uh, I, it would be a pleasure to work with 
stick all these, not only years, but decades. You know, I first met him. Actually, I think I heard, I heard a talk when I was a graduate student in Columbia, New York City. There was a talk, it was initial, I read the initial talk, Wexling, that Dick and yours had a math conference in New York City. And as graduate, graduate students went along with their, the service gophers to set up things. And I heard that talk, but I didn't really understand it at the time. But uh, uh, so, uh, so I just finished doing my PhD. Um, I spent the summer at the R&D Center. And many prominent community scientists have done that at the various summers. And um, the atmosphere was so good that I went there permanently. I mean, working with Dick and Phil was such a pleasure because they were so, so intellectually strong and so insightful. And I continue, and then Dick and I both have this feeling that building the proper models, the proper formal models, is really the crucial step to initiate any study of anything new. And so, you know, we both have this inclination to work with the models first, then define the problems, and then try to figure out, you know, maybe efficient algorithms for them and investigate the complexity. So we had a similar mindset, and we may have different techniques if we emphasize to solve problems, but we have a similar mindset on um, what to work on. And, you know, this, this has been continuing at, at GE and Albany and now, about complexity institute. So it's been an exciting thing to see how this has developed in, in multiple areas of computer science. Then thank you so much. It's uh, so kind of you to say that. Um, Mary Lou, do you have any final thoughts? And then I'll pass it to Ravi and then we'll, we'll close. Uh, uh. No, the only, the only thing I would say is that from the Department of Computer Science at the University of Virginia. We're very happy to have Rich and uh, Del, uh, Dan and Ravi as affiliate members. And I hope we can have a lot more contact with them because it's a great honor to have them as affiliate members. That's Thank all. You so and, I really, and I hope, Dick, it doesn't take another 60 years before we <laughs> So kind of you, Mary Lou, to say that. It's just uh, very nice of you to say that. Thank you so much. Um, Ravi, uh, last words from you, and then uh, we, we'll start closing. I don't have much to say. Again, I want to thank uh, both Dick and Dan uh, for working with me uh, for a, a long time. Thanks, Mo. Thanks, Ravi. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Chris, uh, words from you, and then I will just uh, conclude with a few words. I just want to, oh, sorry, my camera's off. I just want to say again that um, it's really a great privilege to host these. Thank you very much, all of you, for arranging and, and working on it. There's a lot of work that goes on, obviously, behind the scenes. And uh, to Mata, uh, for for thinking of this and doing it. Thank everyone. It was wonderful to hear from you, Dick. And yesterday, it was wonderful to hear from you as well, Dan. And see you later. Thanks, Chris. I want to echo what Chris said and thank you all. Uh, tomorrow's event, model, please. Uh, Say again. You might want to remind people about tomorrow's event. Yes, I will do that. Yes, I want to just thank Grace and and Jill and others who organized this, and to the moderators up until now, uh, Anil yesterday, Melu today, who joined me and Ravi. Uh, you know, for me and Ravi, this is uh, just a dream come true. To be honest, we keep talking to Dick and Dan every two weeks. Ravi talks much more often. Um, and and I'm I'm sorry that everybody did not get a chance to ask questions. Uh, you know, for, there are lots of folks who waited patiently, and I hope uh, we'll get a chance to do this again. Hopefully, this is not the last for it. As uh, uh, Professor Auman said, one of the only silver linings of the pandemic is that this is possible now. So we'll we'll try to do this again. Um, tomorrow we have uh, another session with Dick and Dan. This time together, and Josie from CS Department. Uh, Andrew and Arash are going to host this. And this is going to be more student and young faculty centric because as you heard from very questions that Merlu asked, Ravi asked, uh, you know, young folks can, can take a lot of interesting uh, thoughts uh, away from them. The way science was done then and the way science is done now, uh, there's always something to learn about it. 
Um, so with that, uh, let me close. I want to thank Dick and Dan again. As I said, I don't think the words can really do justice to what I have uh, gained from such a mentorship. Uh, it's just impossible to put it in words and I won't attempt it. Uh, I was just lucky, as Dick says, uh, it was luck that I landed in Albany uh, and I stick st uh, stuck around in Albany. Uh, I don't think so I could have gotten better teachers in my life. Ravi, thank you very much as well. Uh, between three of you and Harry Hunt, whom I tried to call Dick quite a few times, but Harry's phone is disconnected and I couldn't reach him. But I will share the recording with him, Dick, and I you know, certainly miss him. Okay. Uh, but thank you again, everyone, for joining. I, I personally, of course, enjoyed it a lot. Chris has been telling me to do this for a while, along with Kevin. So I thank them both for, for supporting this. They both have been saying, you know, we should get them here and have them talk to, to all of us because they have, uh, they have the right view of things. Biocomplexity is another area where I think they can essentially, again, help us. And Chris said he talked to Dick and Dan already to help, as he said, seek, seek their help to form the right models. Uh, and in fact, we heard from Bob Oman today again that he looks forward to what Biocomplexity has to offer Dick. Juris says hello to you again. You know, he, it's not so easy on the phone, uh, but he, he was uh, thankful that I could get him on the phone even for a minute. Um, he's, uh, it's hard for him to, to hear, I think. And, 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 uh, so we, we couldn't have him on the, on, online on zoom because where, where he is, but he does convey his regards and says hello to you. So with that, thank you very much, everyone. And we'll see you all tomorrow. And I hope you can join us then. So with that, let's close. Thanks again. Thank Greg. you. Yeah. Bye. Yes. Thanks. Bye. Bye.